What's going on, everybody? I'm Cheech, and you're listening to the On The Water Podcast. We got an awesome episode today. The On The Water Podcast is brought to you by Guidesley, and we have a borderline pirate, swordfish, pioneer, actually, uh, Larry Bachman with us. Is it Bachman or Bachman? Bachman. Sorry. It's actually Bachmanski, but yeah, well, no see, one knows that because right. Ellis, Ellis Island fixed that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was going, they didn't even try with my last name. But anyways, um, and, and we got Jimmy Fee here, and we're going to be talking swordfish, canyons, and whatever else comes up. So grab onto your uh, life jackets and let's roll. Yeah, so if you have been reading On the Water for a long time, uh, you might recognize Larry from, I mean, you wrote in some of our earliest issues. I was back in, I think, 95 or 96 with Bill, Bill Howe. Yeah, yeah. way <laughs> back when. Back then, it was mostly uh, doing fly fishing and light yeah. tackles. <laughs> Striper fishing. A long time ago. So, and then how, when did you start offshore fishing? I mean, going back to the, the first skipjack. The, fir- the first skipjack was 2000, was a Carolina Classic in 2000. Uh, but I had been going offshore with a friend at a regulator for half a dozen years before that. Oh. Pushing the boundaries of a regulator 26 back <laughs> before there were such things as big center consoles and right. I got the sickness bad then. That's uh, that's easy to, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's easy to contract once you get a taste of that stuff. It's a special place. Um, you can never seem to get there enough. I treasure my moments there. That's all I can say. I, I, I you know, the moment I leave, I want to go back and yeah. when I'm there, it's just a place you can't describe till you've been there. So you have you had the Carolina Classic. How many years did you fish uh, were you offshore fishing on that one? I fished that from 2000 to 2011. I knew I was getting older. I knew that you know my body was getting tired. I had to switch to a more comfortable boat. Went through a bunch of you know kind of analysis of what my options were, both from a financial and size perspective, cap- capabilities, and decided from uh, my own research as well as from what some friends told me uh, that I wanted to end up at a down east. Spent a couple of years looking for the right down east and that's not an easy thing to find. And ended up buying a boat out of Shelter Island that wasn't perfect and you know, spent a bunch of years making it my boat. <laughs> Can you tell us about the, some of the specs of the, uh, the current skipjack? Uh, the current skipjack is a 36 Northern Bay. It's powered by a Cummins uh, QSM 670 engine. Um, from a canyon capability perspective, it cruises comfortably at 20 knots and burns 19 gallons an hour. And that was back in 2010 or so that was one of the major decision points was can i afford to run this boat and you know today with six dollar a gallon diesel yeah i don't like it but you know i I, i'm still under fifteen hundred dollars a trip for fuel and you know that's not good but it is what it is it could be a lot worse it could be a lot worse and the benefits of a downy style boat going to the canyons. What have you? So you said you wanted that type of boat. Why? Why, why that I, style? I wanted that boat because I, you know, I needed to take care of my body. I wanted to fish into my sixties, which I am now, and um, I, I wanted to be able to get more people on board to to lessen the work, uh, be able to be out of the elements, uh, have a place to sleep. Uh, sleeping in the Carolina Classic was like hold on, you know, put your mouth guard in and hold on because it's going to roll. Um, so, um, you know, that was important. Um, and really the, uh, the ride of the Down East, um, which um, most people jump on it and say the same thing. I can't believe how well this boat rides. And it's, you know, it's a very comfortable boat. If you're going at 20 knots cruise, you don't have the pounding you take at a, 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 a Sportfish 25, 27 knots. And the beauty of a down east is, is you can slow down to the speed that works, and it's still reasonably economical. Mm. So, you know, I, I do a lot of uh, trips where I go out the night before, I run past the Hooter, I run 20 miles, then I pull back to eight knots and just chug, 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 eight knots, and I'm getting about uh, three nautical miles a gallon for that. So I can get to any one of the canyons in under, under 70 gallons. 
Wow. Which is pretty impressive yeah. for that, a 36-foot boat. And that goes a long way in do, being able to do as many canyon trips as you do yeah. in a given season. Yeah, because so. we sleep on the way out. Uh, you know, the, the, the boat's air-conditioned. Uh, it's, a, it's a comfortable ride in, in slop. You know, you're, you're, you're basically below the waterline of the bunks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can, you, you can make it out to wherever you want to go in 10 hours overnight and once you get into august you know what you're gonna have a 10 hour night anyway so mm-hmm. it kind of works especially in the fall yeah it, that gives you a lot of flexibility because you don't have you, you always want to be smart with the weather yeah, obviously yeah. but it gives you a little bit more margin of error in in a boat that's going to handle the rough stuff as well as a down east oh if it's i mean if it's horrible and you know it can be horrible you know i can come back at eight knots yeah, and yeah exactly I'm not going to have to worry about fuel economy. It may not be, you know, it may not be flat calm. You know, you may be rolling, but you know, you can find four places for people to hang on to yeah. and, and get home. You know. Yeah. Now your typical Canyon trip is 24 to 48 hours or somewhere uh, in there. I'm not going to do it for less than 36 hours at this point. Okay. Because even at speed, it's going to take me five hours each way. I want to fish for 24 hours. I want to get at least two, you know, three dawn dusk cycle, you know, dawn or dusk trolls in as well as have the night and an opportunity to day drop for swords. Yeah. I mean, we're not spoiled. The guys in Jersey, I think of as spoiled. Their canyon run is uh, yeah, 40 70, miles shorter than ours. Yeah, yeah. 75 miles. Yeah. I'm jealous. Yeah. And out of Falmouth Harbor, what's your typical run to, to reach the, the fishing grounds? So I, you know, I, I don't count the tips of the canyons anymore. I'm counting a 1500 foot corner somewhere. So... The two Atlantises, or actually the three Atlantises, are about 105 miles. Veach is about 110. Hydro's 120. And at this point, with you know fuel, I think that's as far as I'm going this year. So, <laughs> have you been to any of the further east or east uh, ones in your boat? I've been to Ocean, and we did the overnight chug and the overnight chug back. And I think I did Ocean in less than 200 gallons, which wow. is just that's ridiculous. Insane. And that was 130 something nautical miles, 138, I think. That's a trip. Yeah, it's a trip. I mean, it was forever, but... Yeah. <laughs> how, how big uh, is, is the crew you typically roll with to the canyons? If I, if I have the right three other people, four people is great, five is, five is good, can squeeze six, but I'm going to want to... You know, i got to think real carefully about six. Mm-hmm. I've done that a couple times, and it's... You know, I'm not a charter fisherman, and, you know, I like my space, and... I want, you know, I want to be comfortable. I want to, you know, I want everyone to be comfortable and, yeah. you know, that's important. Yeah. You've done a lot of writing for us about how you kind of divvy up the work among your crew too. And, uh, where you have somebody, somebody sleeping, getting their rest and somebody, so you keep your guys fresh throughout the trip. Have to, absolutely have to. And, and, you know, people who show up and want to work, 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 go, 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 don't want to sleep, going to fish all night, they crash invariably and yeah, when they guilty. Crash, they're so. useless you know <laughs> but it's not a you know you and I, I was like that when I first started 20 years ago too I you know I don't need to sleep I don't need to sleep I can do this and you know you, you're you become useless and dangerous at some point I've done it on I, I've on the party boat trips I'll go out and do a, a canyon party boat trip once or twice a year and I've had it where I'm gonna stay up the entire 36 hours we're there and what hap- what's happened to me twice now is I've fallen asleep at 3 o'clock a.m., which is when I should be awake. And, and the I bite's w- on. Yeah. And you wake up to... Yeah, 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 yeah. All around the boat. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my alarm on my last couple uh, Canyon Party Oof. Boat trips. Well, not the one we were on where that sound didn't happen. I wish so. I slept that whole trip, actually. <laughs> we've, we, you know, we, we've ha- I've woken up many people with a sword on board or, or a big tutor on board, and they're like, where'd that come from? Well, you were sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a tough time sleeping on those trips, but I, I don't really crash. It's the ride in that I'll, I'll, I'll just zonk out and then muscle through like the stuff at the dock, making sure right, it's right. squared away. And then I'm junk for three days, which my wife loves. Well, that's my, that's my, uh, that's usually how I end up finishing out one of those trips. So that's actually one of the interesting things about, you know, a canyon fishing is you've got to manage, you know, I used to call it work-life balance, but it's, you know, fishing life balance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you say, you can't come home and be junk for three days and maintain a relationship with your family. You know, it just doesn't work so well. Yeah, we were saying earlier, you just came in from uh, from 36 hours offshore, 7, eight, uh, 7, 7 p.m. last night. Last yeah. night, yeah. I'm tired, but, you know, I'm functional. I spent the morning cleaning the boat, cutting fish, yada, 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 yada. Oh. And, 
you know, I'm tired. I'm not going to go partying tonight, but I'm fully functional. I got, you know, seven hours of sleep. Good enough. So what is it? This is going to be kind of an open-ended question, but what is it about the canyons? What's, what's grabbed oh, you God. about being out there? What's grabbed me about being out there is it's such an unusual collision of north and south, uh, the hot water, the cold water. You're in the tropics. You're also in New England. The stuff you see there, uh, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples. You just don't see anywhere else. We were trolling uh, with, uh, two nights ago in East Atlantis at dusk, and I wasn't on the wheel. Someone else was on the wheel. I was resting, and he said, you know, how do I adjust this radar? I keep picking up this little blip off to our port. And, you know, I showed him how to zoom it out, how to zoom it in, because I have new electronics. And, you know, we both saw the blip, and he said, there wasn't a boat there. About two minutes later, I hear, Skipjack, vessel skipjack, vessel skipjack, this is United States submarine off your port. We want to make you aware of our presence. Hmm. So I look over, and there's 300 feet of nuclear sub cruising by at whatever speed they cruise on the surface. You know, it was a good speed, and, you know, you just don't see stuff like that inshore. So that's, you know... One example. Uh, One of probably thousands by now, right? Uh, um, you know, a, a second example, and it's nothing to do with fishing, is, is uh, three or four trips ago, I'm looking up and I see, that bird doesn't make sense. Um, what the heck is that? And we're all looking at it, and, and one of the guys with me said, it looks like it should be in the tropics. So I did the best I could with my iPhone, snapped pictures, put it on one of the Facebook wildlife pages, it was a red-billed tropic bird, and Ew. I'm kind of a hero in the rare, the New England rare bird alerts because I got a picture of a red-billed tropic bird, and you know I never knew what a red-billed tropic bird was before this trip. That's cool, man. But it's oh. stuff like that that you see. I mean, seeing a sperm whale. I saw a sperm whale with you on the old yeah, skipjack. Yeah, yeah. In, in East Atlanta, seeing a sperm whale, you know, at a hundred yards is mind blowing. They are so different from the other whales in the way, like, it, they just kind of, the one we saw, it just had a little bit of it out of the water. Yeah. It was like a locomotive, just kind of yeah, going that's straight exa That's exactly surface. how I would describe it. And it's blowing its, it's blowing its spout forward, like, it's, it's puffing. Wow. It was so cool to see, it. I mean, that whale especially, I mean, that was the whaling industry, was the sperm yeah. whale, to be able to put eyes on one. I mean, that was, that was a... So that's the stuff that gets me to the canyons. I don't go there to catch fish. I go there for the experiences. I mean... And the stuff that you see over, you know, trip after trip, it's what keeps me coming back. Putting fish in the boat is a definite bonus. Just everything else that goes on out I, there. I mean, believe me, I'm, I'm not going out there not to catch yeah. fish. And, you know, I'm sitting there in the last of the ninth yesterday and doing what I could and, you know, pulled it off. But, you know, I'm not going to cry if we don't get every fish like I used to. And, you know, I'm out there and... You know, at, at my age, you know, who, kn who knows how many more years I can do it. So I want to love every minute that I'm out there. I mean, especially when the lights go out out there, too. I mean, that's, oh, that's got to be. Best. So, There's yeah, we were just talking about that. At, at 2 a.m., I woke up, to, you know, I had got some rest, woke up, shut off the underwater lights, shut off the deck lights, and there's the Milky Way. And it's just mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah, th not only that, but the, the sunset out there. It, and at times, I don't know. I don't have a ton of experience like you do, but I don't know if it changes, but at one point we were out there and it was pitch black in front of the boat and it was a full on sunset behind the boat. Yeah. And it was like, how is this possible? There's night and, and day in the same, you know, 360 degree it's true. head turn. It's, it's true. You don't, you don't get that 360 degree view anywhere else. And yesterday at uh, sunrise was uh, 530 yesterday. First light was four o'clock. I mean, it was, and it was in the northeast. It was because you know the sun is still a high, a high in the northern hemisphere, and it's just interesting to see stuff like that. You know, th we really didn't have trolling light till maybe quarter of five, but there was that first glimmer of daylight forty-five minutes before. You don't see that here. No. Do you like to get up on the troll in the dark? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm moving. As soon as I can see to the east, I'm moving, and I'm always out in the deep, so I don't have to worry about running over pots. Nice. 
and I stay far away from everyone else till I can see them. Yeah. And that's big eye time before that's, the sun's up. That's big eye time. It's just it's you know it's anything time. It's big eye. It's yellowfin time. Um, we've raised blue marlin in the in the half light. Wow. Um, you know stuff is up at eating. So one thing that uh, I've always loved about your fishing reports, you've done a great job of conveying. Uh, back in the day, it was the old uh, message boards. Was it sportfishing.net? Right, a bunch of them. I mean, I started with real time. Real time, yep. Yeah. And there was the uh, Jeff Smith, what was it, fly fishing salt waters, and then there was the sport fisherman, sportfisherman.com? Yeah, that's like the that. one. That's, yeah. the one. that's the one I remember seeing the yeah. skipjack reports on. And yeah. you would, you, it had to take some time to write because they were very descriptive and they were always so, such an entertaining read. Now it's kind of moved over to Facebook. Which is, wow. you know, it's unfortunate. And it's unfortunate that, you know, I, I didn't preserve all of those for myself. But, it, you know, it was a way of, you know, describing and, and for myself, for my, you know, to reread and think about, you know, what did I experience? And for us, you know, it, you did. You painted a great picture of them. And you've done it in our magazine as well. Just for the guys stuck on land, here's what it's like out there. You know, here's, uh, and then here's, Here's how you made the bite happen. Um, one of the trips Kevin Blinkoff and I did with you years ago, we were at the oh, yeah, shipping yeah, yeah. lanes yeah. where we got the white marlin, and that was out of nowhere. It came out yeah. of nowhere, and it 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 looked at every single bait in the spread. Yeah. And wah, you wah, were wah. up there, Kevin and I. You're like trying to jiggle the rods, and Kevin and I were running around, just basically doing yeah. laps around. You were like knocking it in and out of gear, and fi finally it it committed to one. And, yeah, uh, I remember that. Yeah, that was a and great it uh, beat the heck out of me at the side of the boat. Yeah. If I remember, I, you know, <laughs> and you got some amazing pictures of that and a yellow fin, and I think a mahi. You had some, mm -hmm. or was it a baby mako on that trip? There was a baby, baby mako ba on baby that trip. Mako. Yeah, yeah. Kevin got some good shots yeah. of that one. And I mean. That's what it's all about. Is it's just you know out you know out in the in the blue water. You just don't know what's going to happen. I, I heard yesterday someone caught a barracuda. Oh really? You know, wow. A barracuda in New England. That's weird. Yeah. He said it was like a five foot barracuda. So you know maybe it was a four foot barracuda, but you know. <laughs> so you have a total love affair with swordfish. Safe to say. Yeah, it's a sickness. <laughs> so like, w w when did you when did you first? When did that first start? Like, where did that first start? <laughs> 2004. Yeah, was it out here in our it canyons was, at night? Out here in our canyons at night. Um, I was in the Carolina with two other friends. One guy was you know, possibly more experienced than me. He was sleeping. Uh, a rod went off. I reeled it up. I saw the long, thin shape down below, and I, I started screaming, swordfish, swordfish, I need help. <laughs> and he's like, it's not a swordfish, it's a blue shark. <laughs> it doesn't come up. <laughs> and I, you know, I got it up again. It's swordfish, swordfish, ah, it's not a swordfish. Um, so eventually it broke off, or I pulled the hook, or whatever happened, and it was gone. It was burned in my memory, and then I talked to Damon, uh, Damon Sacco the next day, because he had been out there. He caught a swordfish right next to me. So kind of two and two went together that, you know, they're not extinct and they are out here. And I was probably two years before I actually caught my first. And it was, if it was legal, you know, shame on me for saying this. I didn't even know what the size was. Um, it was barely legal. Uh, but, you know, just to see my first swordfish caught in my own boat and just to look at this thing, it's like, how does something like this exist? <laughs> Because they're just crazy fish. I mean, you know, the, the eye is just massive. The, the, the sword is half the length of the body. And you know, the, the, the shoulders and the power that you can see in it is just impressive. Now, in 2004, they were relatively rare? Like, th there weren't many guys catching them back then? or I don't know. I'm sure that they were catching them. But the longliners had, had done a number on them and you know I want to make this really clear I'm not against longliners cuz I've been accused of that by a couple longlining friends um, but you know there was a lot going on back in the 80s and 90s that did a number on some of our fisheries which has been long since corrected uh, by both commercial and recreational fisheries so I, I think back then it was an unusual catch but it wasn't you know impossible mm -hmm. And once I started learning how to target them, you know, I started becoming more successful. And when did that, so once you caught your first one, did you start shifting your, all your nights toward looking for swordfish? And no, kind of I, was st I was still into the, you know, catch tuna at night, you know, try and catch a shark at night. <laughs> 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 you 
And then the swordfish started coming. I think we had a three swordfish night in like 2007 in West Atlantis. Um, I had that small boat, so I couldn't really fish past September. It just became impossible. Then I got the bigger boat in 2012, and it opened up the end of September and October. And, you know, the, the first year I had that boat in uh, uh, October, we had a six swordfish night. They were wow. small, Jeez. but it was like the light went on. So um, you kind of figured out then, like, all right, there's a, there's a biomass of swordfish yeah. here on a regular How basis. How do I target them? Yeah. So, you know, then the next seminal moment was, you know, I got to give uh, my friend John Pilcher a lot of credit for um, turning me on, both to, you know, focusing on sword fishing at night, but more importantly, the concept of uh, deep dropping for swordfish in the day. And John was the guy who had done it in Florida. Or I had done it once or twice, and it was like, okay, that's really, really complex. I don't fully understand it. <laughs> but John had a reel that embraced the complexity. So, you know, we kind of worked on it together with a couple of other friends. Um, did our first day drop in June, early June of 2014, which was a year that we had warm water. Warm blue water very early. So I think it might have been like June 6th or June 8th. Uh, John put the whole rig together, had a bait sewed up. <laughs> We're looking at him like you're nuts as we dropped it down 1,500 feet. And he says, there's a bite, there's a bite, there's a bite. I didn't see it. <laughs> and, you know, as is the case with a deep dropping swordfish, it fell, up, fell off halfway up. So, you know, n no satisfaction on that trip. We got a couple that night, um, so we knew they were around. Two weeks later, we went back to the same spot, and um, first drop, hooked up, <laughs> and got it to the boat. Um, I looked at the pictures a few days ago. It was probably a 60-inch, 100-pound swordfish, uh, and you know that just changed the game. <laughs> now, just you know, for like the layman's. Uh you know, not in layman's terms, but you measure swordfish from the lower jaw, correct? The lower jaw, which, so. you know, a, a sword, the, the legal limit for a swordfish is 47-inch lower jaw length. And fortunately or unfortunately, a swordfish probably has 12 inches of lower jaw. I mean, it, it's a long lower jaw, jaw. Obviously, the bill in the upper jaw is very long, but mm -hmm. the lower jaw is, you know, adds a lot of length to what's a small fish. So a 47, 48 inch fish, what, what, you know, how much meat do you get off of that's a swordfish? A 30, that's a, that's like a striper. It's a 30 pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a 30 pound striper. It's, really? Yeah, wow. It's not that big. Yeah. Hmm. We got one yesterday or uh, Wednesday night that was 55 inches. I'm going to guess it was 60, 60 to 70 pounds. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a solid fish. There's, you know, there's nice meat on it. It gives, it gives great steaks. But once they get above 60 inches, then you start getting into what they call a marker, a 100-pound sword. And, you know, it's, it's a different game then. It's a different animal then, too. So for the daytime fishing, it, it's not as simple as saying, okay, I'm going to take my regular old rig and I'm just going to let all the line out. Like, it, it is a very, just dropping the bait <laughs> is a whole oh production. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's... Uh, you start with a big electric reel, and you know there's plenty of reasons to hand crank. There's, there's plenty of opportunities to hand crank swords, but you know what? I'm in New England. I'm only going to get a dozen trips a year. I'm going to get beat up in at least half of them, and I want to optimize my time in the water. So I'm using electric reels. Uh, we've tried hand cranking. It's you know it's it wears out a crew real fast when you're doing the insanity that I'm doing, which is trying to be as efficient as possible and get as many drops in as possible. I want stuff up and down as fast as possible. And, um, you know, hand cranking, maybe if, you know, if I were in Florida or if I were in the Gulf of Mexico, New Zealand, absolutely. But if I'm going 100 miles and, you know, putting this trip together for two days, you know, I want to maximize my opportunity to catch something. How long does it take you to get a bait 1,500 feet down? Okay, so we're, you know, we're, using an electric, we're using a big electric reel. We're using a big electric reel that's got probably four to 5,000 feet of line on it. It's got a mile of line on it. We're putting it down 1,500 feet with a 6 to 10-pound weight. Uh, You've got to drop it slowly because you have a 100-foot leader. The weight is 100 feet away from the bait. So if you drop too fast... You're gonna end up spinning the bait, you know, spinning the bait, the leader and bait up into the braid, and then you got a nightmare. Mm -hmm. 
and I've done plenty of nightmares. So it's, it's an exercise in patience of dropping a little, slowing it down, dropping a little, slowing it down, till you get maybe 800, 900 feet down, then you can let it go, but you're still tending to the spool, um, the inside of the spool if it's an LP, the side of the spool if it's a hooker, to slow the bait so that it's not in complete free spool. Um, so in answer, the, the short answer to your question is probably 10 minutes to get down. And the boat's in gear during this whole process, typically, um, right? Bumping in gear, in and out. Yeah. We don't have current. In Florida, you, you're constantly in gear. Here, because we have very little current. My boat's ridiculous. It moves six knots at idle. So, you know, I'm bumping for a second, yeah. stopping, bumping for a second, stopping, trying to get a one to two knot speed mm. to get that bait down. And then once it hits... Then you kind of back up are you, to it. Are you Is contacting that... bottom? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Now we got to add, add to the complexity. Yeah. So we fish two rods. The first one out is the buoy rod. And what that basically is, is you're putting a, you're putting a floss loop somewhere on, that, somewhere on that spool, and you're going to fish that bait at that depth. Now, I, I have mine set at about 1,150 feet because I have a theory, which... I'm starting to believe is there's an awful lot of swordfish swimming above the deep bait that's down there at the bottom. And, you know, I may be right, I may be wrong, but we're catching swordfish at 1,150 feet. Last year I had it at 1,400 feet, and we contacted bottom way too much with it. So with this 1,100-foot buoy, 1150 foot buoy I'm able to deploy in 1150 feet working out to the deep by the time we get it down I'm in 1250 feet we start driving the boat away probably about 200 300 yards so that buoy is a bobber floating out 300 yards away for the boat then we do the same with the tip rod now the tip rod goes all the way down to the bottom so I want that on the bottom then when we hit bottom bring it up a hundred feet let it sit there for a few minutes, move it up, move it down, fish it like you'd fluke. Fish it like you'd, you know, okay. bounce a jig for stripers off Devil's Bridge. So yeah. it's not a set it and forget it by any means. You know, so. It's not a set it and forget it. And, you know, anyone who's telling you you've got to be 100 feet up or 50 feet off or right on the bottom, I don't think there's, you know, I think you've got to go figure it out every trip. And every trip is different. Trip one this year, we had three bites taken out of our hands, putting the buoy down. Hmm. Didn't have a single tip rod bite. Second trip, all the bites were in the tip rod. Every, every, you know, every day is fit, you know, it's, uh, go to middle ground, you know, in May, you know, one day they're on top, the next day they're down beneath, beneath. you know, tide changes. One of the, uh, the most striking photos you've posted this season was the, uh, the buoy all shriveled up and pruned <laughs> when the fish took it. You said it took it 500 feet down. That was that, that was that first trip where they were eating on the way down. So all of those fish had a bait in their mouth before we got to 1,100 feet. That was a 49-inch fish that came up drowned. So what happened was uh, Chuck Martinson, who you know, mm -hmm. was with me, and he's put out a lot of buoys. And, you know, he said, there's a fish on this. You know, I've put out enough buoys. I know there's a fish on this. Like, yeah, 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 sure, Chuck. Put the buoy on. So he put the buoy on and the buoy just went straight down because that fish had picked up the bait somewhere in the middle of the water column and swum straight down with it. And what I learned from that, because I asked a bunch of questions on one of the sword fishing forums is, and it goes back to my old diving experience, once that, that float, a lobster float gets below 33 feet, it's now neutral uh, and it has no more buoyancy. All it has is the resistance. Wow. So what happened was that swordfish was swimming down to the bottom. It took that buoy four or 500 feet down, and what was a lobster buoy came up looking like a little shriveled orange. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. So that buoy goes under that far. It no longer has buoyancy, no buoyancy. to come All floating it back up, really. Yeah. Wow. And it, it was crushed by the pressure. And, you know, it's been a long time since I dove, but I believe every 33 feet is one atmosphere. So if it went down wow. 330 feet, that's 10, you know, 10 times the pressure on it. And it just crushed it. <laughs> that's wild. Um, so just to kind of 
you know, map this all out. The buoy rods, the buoy is bearing all the weight of the rig that's below it. Yeah. And then that's on like a, a, a floss loop. Then you have your line to the tip of the buoy rod. Yeah. Um, so trout, you know, tr- fishing a, a, a float for trout, fishing a float for sea trout, you know, one of those, you know, the, the bobber approach. Yep. It's a bobber. Yep. And that just gets that, that rod out of the way so that you can deploy a second. Yeah, because let's talk about the challenges of having two 1,500 feet <laughs> pieces of string down there and a fish on one of them. If they come together, you are in a bad <laughs> spot. Yeah. So you got to get it far enough away. And we, the first year we did a buoy, whatever it was, four years ago, you know, we had our two weights cross. Fortunately, it was just the weights, but you know, it was probably half an hour, 45 minutes of picking stuff apart. And, and that's, that's yeah, prime time. I mean, yeah, that you're you, out there. You're dying when that oh. happens. And they're like, ah, you, and you, you know, you can cut everything away, but you know, it still takes time to get back in the game. The On the Water podcast is brought to you by Guidesly. Are you looking to book a fishing trip with a renowned hand selected expert in the field? Guidesly has the best guides in the best destinations. Whether you've never fished before, or you're a regular on the water, let Guidesly hook you up with the best captains in your area. They'll put you on the best catches of your life. You can search and book your dream trip now on Guidesly.com or download their app, Guidesly Fishing Trips. Book a Guidesly trip today and create memories that will last a lifetime. Now, before the, you started doing the buoy fishing, could you, were you only fishing one rod? Yeah, when we started this, you know, John, myself, a um, bunch of guys who were involved with me, Jackson Parmenter, Christian Valley, you know, all we knew was one rod. And the other boats that were out there with us, uh, Jim, Jimmy Noon on uh, Midnight Rambler, the, the Howd guys on Tokotomas, um, Lou DeFusco, um, you know, we were all just fishing one rod, just, and, and we were getting bites. Oh. Amazing. And, you know, when we started it, the first year in 2000, you know, the first year we did it really seriously was 2015. And if we did eight drops in a day, we'd get bit on six of them and we'd get multiple bites. Wow. You know, wow. It was just, you know, we, we hit a good patch, you know, in a good year and it was really, really good. Now, what you alluded to earlier was that you lose a number of them, quite a few fish. Or that first year, we lost eight out of ten. And wow. you know, I, I look back and I see all the mistakes we made. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to fish with a Florida commercial fisherman named Steve Diffenbacher, who's running boats up here, and he's taught me a lot. Um, but you know, let the fish eat is all I can say. If they're slashing, I mean, the sword, you know, the swordfish is an attack feeder. It's slashing with that bill. It's you know, it's cut you know it's cut 10 million squid in pieces and circled back over its lifetime so if it's slashing at your bait the last thing you want to be doing is playing with it yeah you want to tease it a little but the best thing you can do is just put it in the bottom and let it eat it Hmm. and and you know that's what i did yesterday that's what happened yesterday and it turned into you know zero to hero in 30 seconds oh yeah so the the way the swordfish eats is it does use that sword to is it would it be similar to the way a marlin does? Like I think, or is it more of a more aggressive? Like I think of the I, marlin and bill billfish, you know, like the surface billfish, where they kind of trip the bait up. It's almost like they get behind it and just try to throw it out of its uh, you know, rhythm. Yeah, I think so. I th- I th- you know I think so. I mean, I've obviously seen plenty of marlin feed. Uh, you know, the, the window washer, window wiper yeah. thing on the surface. Uh, you know, we don't know from a sword because no one's down 1,500 feet, whether they're rooting in the mud, which, you know, is something I believe that, you know, they're, they're mud fish, you know, they're, they're, they're lying on the bottom or running around the bottom. No we catch them all scratched up like stripers coming off of middle ground when they're feeding on crabs. The, the bills, you know, are all notched and broken. You know, it looks like they're rooting in the mud for God knows what. Oh. So, you know, I, I think that bill is, you know, is a, is a tool, and especially with squid, you know, you can visualize a squid swimming along at, at, at squid speeds. You're not going to run that down and open your mouth and eat it. You, you're going into a school of squid, and you're whack, 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 and then circling Pick back. Pick up the pieces. Yeah. They're big garbage cans, people say, that do yeah. a lot of sword fishing. That I think so. A lot yeah. of people, you know, obviously sword, sword guys have their, you know, favorite baits and they get crazy about their baits but there's just as many guys that will say if you put anything that's going to present 
properly in front of a swordfish, it's probably going to eat it. Yeah, I've heard the stories. I don't, I've never talked to him, but I've heard Nick Stanzik has caught him on a hot dog or a sausage or something wow. or other. Oh, man. <laughs> that's kind of funny. Now, will uh, they come up with their stomach contents intact? Or oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's, that, that's, the be, that, that's the best fun. Well, it's not the best fun of all, but, you know, what's, you know, what was he eating? And right now, a lot of small squid, uh, tons of snake mackerel. Um, oh, yeah. Which are, you know, these little six-inch teethy, um, they almost look like a mini wahoo. Because for years, I used to net them on, in the lights at night wow. and think they were like wahoo. They're not wahoo. They're snake mackerel. And, um, the, you know, they're grubbing them on the bottom, little eely things. Uh, the treasure last year is Chuck uh, cut open um, maybe a 70-inch, 200-pound swordfish. It wasn't a very big fish, but it had a 28-inch mantle of a squid in it. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a That's big, a big piece squid. of squid. No kid. I didn't know we had squid that size in our canyons, uh, well, man. Well, I'm looking, you know, I'm... I'm looking at pictures of the one we got yesterday and it had two scars on either side of the body two circular scars and like some sort of drag mark going down to the tail and Don Petraca who I think you know saw oh, yeah. the picture I put on Facebook and he said giant squid and I hadn't even thought about that but I'm sitting and looking at the marks wow. going back from that hole down to the tail and wondering you know is that what you know is that what to gra grab this fish at some point or other. Now, living where they do, I mean, down 1,100, 1,800 feet, that water temperature is fairly stable throughout the year. Are they highly migratory? Like, are these fish just yeah. coming up? We know they're migratory. We know they come in with a Gulf Stream. You know, I, I, I've done enough at this point. I've been doing this long enough to believe that they're coming in with the eddies from the east. Um, I'm paying attention online now, and the guys in the Carolinas catch a couple. Um, but the Jersey guys don't really catch any in the summer. They get it in the fall. I talked to Steve recently, and you know he said they're riding it in the Gulf Stream. He's tied in with the longliners. He knows that industry. They're riding it in the Gulf Stream, and then they're riding the coast. You know, they're riding the counter eddy down the coast in the fall. Hmm. That's um, interesting because you brought up the point that it is a very stable temperature down there. But, but the fact they move vertically throughout nighttime daytime right that probably what dictates where they want to be but here's the you know here's the other piece of all of this which is is that we know pe i know people who have caught them in december which no thanks i really don't <laughs> want to be 100 miles out of december i think and birthday soon. you know i've seen enough comments posts writings whatever from longliners that have caught them out there in february wow you know are they on the bottom are they moving through warmer water you know I don't know. I've, I've been out there as early as late May. We didn't get a bite, but, you know, you're throwing one bait down 1,500 feet. Maybe they were on the other side of the canyon. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I can absolutely tell you I have caught swordfish in New England as early as July 6th. I'm sorry, June 6th. That's, I, I mean, that's earlier than most guys are even thinking about tuna. Yeah. yeah. And I can absolutely tell you I saw a swordfish in the northern half of the dump on a June trip a couple of years ago, sitting on the surface. That was one of my questions for you. Of all your, your canyon trips, have you seen them sunning it? So you just answered that. Have you okay. seen that more than once or just the one time? Uh, I have, I mean, I, I've seen probably a dozen over the years, but there are four that stick with me because they were all up, way up in the traditional harpooning grounds. In one of those early bluefin June bites, oh God, early, 2010 something you know call it 2010 or 12 or something or other um my wife and i were out trolling and trolling in one of those really good bites you know i'm guessing now as i sit and think about it i'm guessing it was 2011 there were bluefin everywhere and i trolled over a purple fish i said oh there's a white marlin there's a white marlin i, I look back at that now you know years later and realize i trolled over uh, you know a, a hundred pound swordfish up in the bluefins in june wow I saw one coming back near the Hooter, not at the Hooter. Same thing. Thought it was a white marlin. And then, you know, years later realized that thing was purple. That wasn't a white marlin. <laughs> near the Hooter, man. That's yeah. so close. Five miles south of the Hooter. We have a flag upstairs from, I think it's 1963, the first Cuddy Hunk Invitational Swordfish yeah. Tournament. And they had the hours on it where... You couldn't make it to the canyons in the boats they had then. They were all fishing inshore and trolling for them. Yeah, Ted Blount, who I think has written for you, 
wrote an incredible article about his experiences mm -hmm. as a dory man for his father who was quite the sportsman in the 50s it was an awesome article and yeah it was an awesome article he's an awesome person he's got awesome stories and it was all about going one hour two hours south of block or one hour two hours south of nomads and it was 10 knot boats so they weren't going far mm -mm. it'd be so awesome to see that fishery come uh, back yeah. they have it in california to an extent where they see them but it seems like for every 20 they see on the surface one will turn to a bait like yeah, they're, they're clearly yeah, not up yeah. there eating and uh, you know i know you know uh, there's, there's been what maybe a dozen trolled up over the past half dozen years um you know and they're all big fish up on the surface some at night some in the day yeah. wow. we're just ta you know we're just tapping it because i don't think people target them oh i certainly don't target them other than in the deep hmm. and you know there's probably a lot more of them than we realize running around at 400 feet, just like they are in Nova Scotia. So they, be, uh, see, I didn't even realize they made it up that far. I figured it was kind of the canyons and then further east. But I guess, I mean, I mean, I can, I can send you all the books I've, I've read and I get quite a collection of, of books that I've read about swordfish over the years. And it's all the old timer books. And, and there's a book, I forget the, the title, it's swordfish something or other. It's a block. It's a history of sword fishing from a commercial fisherman who was in Block Islands from the 30s through the 60s, and it talks about, you know, where the first swordfish, who would see the sword for, and catch the first swordfish, and it was always like June 25th off Block, it was July 4th off Nomans, it was July 20th down by, uh, I think what we call the star, you know, the star or, or um, uh, not the gap, um, Tyler's Gap now, and then by um, the end of July, early August, they'd be on the other side of the shoals. Um, and then it was hurricane season, so they couldn't fish anymore. It's a fascinating book. Wow. So if you, if you were going to just, you know, on a hunch, go out and try to target a sword that's, you know, probably in 400 feet of water, would you, how would you go about that, hypothetically? Uh, I'd look for just like I... I'd go white marlin fishing, yeah. which I don't do very often, and I'd keep my eyes peeled for a different fin. That's yeah. all I could say. And I'd go back to all those old timer books and kind of read, you know, try and discern from the patterns where to look for them because it's a big ocean and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a tiny little fin. From what you're hearing, yeah, I mean, you've got a pretty, I imagine you have a good network of guys you talk to from up and down the coast about yeah. the fishing. How's the sword fishing been over the last 10 years? You know, incredibly, is it incredibly, you know, incredibly, impro incredibly improved. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what it was in the 70s, so I can't say if it was back or not. But, you know, you're seeing regular catches of big fish um, down in the south and up and down the coast. Um, Joey Lombardi, who I, you know, who's been fishing out there as long as I have, caught a, what was it, 587 cord fish uh, in Atlantis three weeks ago, um, you know, unbelievable fish, 105 inch lower jaw length. Um, wow. My friend Jackson Parmenter and Jimmy Noon were off Gloucester blue finning a couple of Septembers ago, two miles off Gloucester and 180 heard, feet of water. I heard about that. They're blue finning. They got a bait in the bottle, a, a bait in the bottom, a live mackerel down to the bottom, and it goes off. They fight the fish like you fight a bluefin on a 130 with 40 pounds of drag for a couple of hours, and up comes a swordfish. And you know it was a holy shit moment. Right. And probably wow. the only the, the, on, the only two guys, you know, who possibly would have had a shot of land, landing it, <laughs> you know, got a harpoon in it, and you know, wow. I forget what that was. It was you know it was high high fives cord, so it was a you know 600 plus pound fish off Gloucester. It's <laughs> unbelievable. That's I mean that's wild. A the winers, the winers, the harpooning family from uh, Maine. I know they harpooned the seven hundred pounder somewhere in the Gulf of Maine less than five years ago. Seven hundred pound. That's, a, that's always like the most interesting, like Facebook creeping that I do is when a long when a harpoon guy gets on there and shares old pictures of, of swordfish oh, harpooning. Sick. I just go through like that it's person's crazy. entire profile. It's crazy. Every one of those pictures are awesome. Yeah, I mean, you see those pictures of wooden boats, you know, even sailboats, because uh, Nelson's Blount's boat, I think, was a diesel engine, but it was also sail-powered. And, you know, they'd be wow. sailing after swordfish. I mean, go figure. 
Jesus. Wow. Yeah, that will help with the fuel economy. A but you know, you, 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 you yeah, you, you got a good point. I, hey, I've talked to, I've talked about putting a green stick in a cell on the green stick. I, 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 it's not a joke. I believe that with two windsurf sails, I could get home from the canyons with if I lost power. Oh yeah. <laughs> have you? So you haven't done the green stick yet? No, I don't have a green stick. I don't have a green stick because I really don't enjoy trolling as much as I did a few years ago, and it's cost complexity and all that stuff. But you know, I've joked about putting half of one on and you know rigging a sail for it. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're lo- out there long enough, you see crazy things. One of the craziest things I saw was a sailboat kicking our butt in hydro about eight or ten years ago. It was one of the Forsbergs who run the Viking fleet out of Montauk. Oh, yeah. Wow. And he's got a sailboat. He's got a canyon sailboat. And he fishes off that sailboat. And, you know, he was cruising along at whatever our trolling speed was, six or seven knots, and he was out fishing us three to one. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's it was fascinating. Was he you catching know, him right out of his wake, like... I, I don't know. All I know is, is that, you know, you'd see him, um, what's it called, go up into the wind. You know, he'd, he'd let the sail go and he was reeling in another fish. And we're wow. Like, well, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> I know what we're doing wrong. I mean, you make a noise. Going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So just to dip back the swordfish, to fight them, you mentioned that landing it on the giant tuna gear with 40 pounds of drag, that's not typically, you don't really hammer down on them. You have to give them a little bit of... They have the... Okay, so let's let's just talk about this last, tri- this last trip. Um, we, we had a double header at night. Um, we, we got the first one, the 54-inch fatty, um, and I was on the second. Um, it was in the rod holder for a while, and the drag was set at 17 pounds. I was making no headway with it. It was just stalled. I put a belt on. I started pumping it. I, I turned it. I started moving it. It surged, and it was gone. I pulled the hook on it. That's the problem is they have such a soft mouth. Um, I, I've pulled hooks out of a ton of swordfish. If it's not in bone in the jaw, it's a crapshoot. If it, it, it if, if it's in the face, if they swat it and the hook gets them outside in, you know, you're going to lose a lot of those fish. Um, we've seen fish, we've, I, I, I remember the first big one we caught, we broke, we broke the jawbone. And it was just dumb luck that we didn't lose it. The, you know, the, the hook was around the jawbone and the jawbone had broken. Wow. And it was just kind of holding, holding on by the, the shards of, of the bone. So you, you, hook, you hook a swordfish, off the, on the bottom, 1,500 feet down. What's your philosophy on fighting that fish? And, and how does the swordfish react after it knows it's hooked? What's interesting to me, before, before we talk about that, the bite, the bite that far down. Oh, you said it, it, your first one, you didn't even, it didn't register to you as a bite. Yeah, it, it's just, you sit and look at that rod tip. The, the boat is rolling, and every day it's rolling differently because, you know, you might be in three-foot seas, you might be in five-foot seas. So you got to go figure out the, uh, you got to go figure out you know, what the pattern of that rod tip is. Every rod tip is different, and you're looking for something different. Um, you know, there's probably three or four different things that could happen. One is that, you know, the, you know, the, the dream is that the rod tip goes down and drag cup goes peeling off. Well, that never happens. Or actually, it does happen, but rarely. Um, two is the rod gets light. All of a sudden, it's not bouncing, and it's standing more upright. So... Um, Rob Daly, was, uh, who's fished with me a long time, was on the rod Wednesday, and he said, hey, Larry, this doesn't look right. And, you know, I look at it, and he looks at him, you know, the rod's standing up. And this is one of those crafty craft custom uh, rods that are a lot of bend in them. And it's like, yeah, you know what? You got a fish swimming up with it. You know, we never came tight on it, but, uh, you, know, it was de- you know, it was definitely there. Then you get the fluke bite, which is, is the, you know, the, the twitch, twitch, twitch of the rod. And you know that, that you know, then the crapshoot starts. Is what do I do? Do I drop it down? Do I tease it up? Do I wait? And you know it's you know blind man's bluff from fifteen hundred feet. <laughs> <laughs> the On the Water podcast is brought to you by Guidesley. Hey, charter captains, are you tired of pouring all your money and time into all the stuff that comes with running a charter business other than the actual fishing? Guidesley gets it. That's why they created Guidesley. Guidesly is built for guides, and they understand and solve the unique challenges that you face every day. Let Guidesly handle your book of business from technology to customer management, leaving you to handle the fishing. Become a guide on Guidesly.com and download the Guidesly Pro app today. Focus on what you do best, putting customers on the fish. 
and leave the rest for guides lead a handle. So you hook a fish on the bottom, we say are. it's 1500 feet, like, and let's just say that you get the bite, you know, the fish is on there. What does the fish do when it realizes it's got a hook in it? And how do you deal with that from that point to trying to get them to the end game? So you see the bite, you, let's just say you put it back at the bottom, you wait a bit and you press the button and you're tight. We got we got a caller on line two. <laughs> caller on line two is going to have to wait. Is Mike from Atlantis? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Sylvia from West Moraine, to be honest. <laughs> so so you got that you got that bite. You press the button. How does the fish react, and what's that like until you have a shot at ending the game? I, you know, honestly, I don't know. I have a fish on until that rod stalls, and you know, when you see the rod stall, you have a pretty good idea you have a fish on yeah maybe the rod's twitching a little but maybe it's you pressing the button but when it stalls you know you have a fish on so then the fun starts um we've learned you know you want to get some good drag to set that hook um unless you know it's if it's stalled the fish is on there's mm-hmm. no you know there's no question about it if it's stalled that it's taking drag it's it's set the hook for you you've got that weight six to ten pounds you know holding that hook in but you want to make sure that you got a you know you got a hook in there. There's too many times you get the whack 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 and nothing happens. Now, is it a circle hook or a J hook? J hook. J hook. Okay. Haven't, haven't, I haven't graduated to circle hooks yet. Does anybody use them for swords? Or? The, the uh, New Zealanders do. Okay. And I need to learn how to do that because that's another weapon in the arsenal. But back to what do I, what do I do? Um, we may push the drag up for a minute just to make sh- you know to try and get as good a hook set as possible. I'm not convinced that really means a lot with 2,000 feet of line out. I'll push the boat forward 20 yards, 30 yards to help stretch that line and get a better hook set. And once that reel is stalled, you know, you got to fish on. So now comes the strategy, um, how to get it up. You can muscle it up with 20, 24 pounds of drag, or you can do the approach that Steve's taught me, which is let the fish swim up. It's going to swim up against the weight. So fight it with less, you know, light drag and let it come up. Theoretically, the weight is always keeping yeah. that hook nice and taut onto the fish, and the fish just basically, you know, starts to head to the surface. So as far as he knows, the danger's below when he feels yeah. that he's, weight. He's, yeah. got a, he's, got a weight, he's got a weight pulling down, and, you know, I've seen enough situations. So two trips ago, we had a swordfish jumping on the surface. We, we were at the lead or 100 feet away from it, and the weight's, you know, straight down. Uh, the line's going straight down and there's the swordfish jumping 100 feet out because the weight, you know, is down 30 feet and it's jumping free on the leader. So, it, you know, it's up above the weight and that weight is, you know, keeping your hook set. So if you can get it to swim up, which is what happened yesterday, um, you know, the best thing that happens is if that fish swims up, you're fighting with light, light drag. I fought the fish we got yesterday 69 inch fish, 175 pounds maybe, um, good solid fish. I fought it with 17 pounds drag and I had the reel set at kind of creep mode. It was coming in at 100 feet a minute, really, really slow, but it was working. The fish was swimming up. Why, why, you know, Steve's convinced me, don't pull on it, you know, let it come to you. And, you know, when I was talking about Albie, how do you, Albie fish? How many times have you caught Albies by letting them do their thing and, you know, eventually they turn and come to you, you know? Exactly, yeah. So, you know, this one, this one, by the time we got the buoy, we got the buoy back because I, I had some equipment issues the day before and had to re-rig it on the fly. I didn't trust some of my connections. So we, I was super ginger getting the buoy off, took it at 100 feet a, a minute to get that 1,000 feet in. So it was 10 minutes to the buoy. Um, nice and slow, really patient, 17 pounds drag. The second we got the buoy off, you could see the line was scoped way out. That fish was up. So 100 feet a minute was working. So I just left it at that and it just kept, kept coming. Eventually I figured out that what the fish was doing, you know, and you know, when you're on the rod, you've done this enough, you start to think about, you know, you start to think, what's the fish doing? You know, with an albie, you know, you know, you know, is it screaming away from you? Is it turning? Is it circling? You understand, you know, you, you understand what you're connected to. So I realized the fish was swimming in a big circle, but it was swimming with me. 
So I was just slowly leading it where I wanted to, and it just kept coming. So we did, you know, I never changed. I never changed the drag. I never changed the speed. I just left it at 100 feet a minute, and you know, however long it take, takes to get 1,200 feet of line in, you know, 12 more minutes. Yeah. There we were at the weight. We had a nice clean removal of the weight, and that's the you know that's one of the tricky things. The second you take that weight off, you've removed that you know pressure on the hook. So you got to have the boat bumping forward, and the guy that's taking the weight off, it, you know, it, it, you've got a long line clip. Got to be seamless. Loose. It's got to be smooth. It can't be boing because yeah. you know <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many fish I've lost to to boing. You know. Wow. <laughs> You know, you, you, you let go of the line, it pops up, and the fish is gone. You know? oh. So we, we had a nice, clean release. It kept coming. You know, it just seemed like the right thing to do to pick up the speed a little. It kept coming. I got to the lights, and the lights are tie, uh, tied on by small rubber bands about 45 feet and 30 feet from the, from the, the bite leader. So, uh, you know, they, they get to the rod tip, and you need a little more force to pop those rubber bands. So I started doing the yank and crank. I could feel the fish turn, so I just kept pulling, and it came like a puppy to the boat. Uh, we missed the harpoon shot. It is what it is, but it never flipped out. Uh, I, I gave it another yank, and someone was able to get a gaff in it. And you know, every fish is different, but we never really pulled on it. And the only time I pulled on it was 30 feet out, and I did it. You know, it wasn't a jerk; it was a just keep it coming thing, and it worked. Huh. That's awesome. So, you know, and, and we've had other fish that are demon fish that, you know, you're driving around, the, you know, you're driving around it, it's diving under the boat, it's trying to get into the props, it's, you know, it, it's running away, it's jumping, and then, you know, then, 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 you know, you have a higher chance of losing, you know, losing things. Yeah. Is it, so, is it different at night when you get a bite? Night is so, you know, night is usually so subtle. So, the, the, we doubled up. Uh, two nights ago, I was I was half sleeping at the time, and I heard the boat bump. Uh, and you know, I've done this enough that I know that if the boat's moving, you know something's going on. But I didn't hear anyone screaming, so I just stayed down there. I heard it bump again. I'm starting to get up when someone comes down. And Larry, Larry, we got a swordfish on. Um, I get up there. They had they had got the the float on. So I floss loops onto my um, my night night rods, and I learned this from John also. Uh, I put floss loops at about 40 feet for the weight-light combination, and then I have different depths that I want to fish at. One at 100, one at 150, one at 250. So they had already got the, the, the float of the 150-foot deep one off, and they got the weight and light off, and then the fish went down, and they were at stalemate. You know, I got up just in time to pick up the second one. Um, he fought that first one pretty hard and got it to the boat you know we, we we gaffed it and got it in but i pulled the hook on the second one but you know the night bite is a lot more subtle the float you got your three floats out in a line out in the dark and if one changes one starts moving around it gives you an indication that there's a sword on so you know you, you might hear the of, of a line going off but more often than not the floats moving yeah. The, the, now, do you do the like the glow stick on top of the balloon where you see if it's upside down? Oh no, no, no. We're using pool pool noodles. This oh, is okay. this is a John Pilcher brought it back from Florida. So I just take a white pool noodle, uh, duct tape a long line clip into the bottom, shove two light sticks on the top, duct tape to kind of hold it okay. in place, and now you got a you know six foot, four foot bobber. You know, yeah. out there, impossible to miss. With, you know, the, yeah, exactly, impossible to mi miss. And it's those a, lay down a lot when when yeah. you get bites. Yeah, so uh, taking the, the pressure fish off them. Swims up, which they, you know, they do. Uh, way back before I understood what I was doing, I lost so many swordfish. You know, sitting there chunking away, and all of a sudden you'd see a light ripping around. What's that light doing over there? Oh, <laughs> that's a swordfish. Oh, that was a swordfish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because when you, I mean, when you're floating anything, it's usually in a fairly straight line. Yeah, exactly. Know? And as soon as one gets out of line, you know, you know something's, something's amiss. Yeah. Something's it. And and you know that's what they said. That, you know, one of them started moving around. It did, didn't make sense. And you know, yeah. they reeled, and there they were. Oh. So I have I have a uh, one more deep drop question. What's the strangest thing you've caught while daytime fishing for swordfish? Have you got any any oddball species in the deep? Or? We've got one third of one pomfret last October. 
Um, <laughs> good shark. Yeah, yeah. It came up enough to say, that's not a swordfish. Uh, and then the guy on the reel said, it's a big eye. And I'm like, that's not a big eye. And then all of a sudden you start seeing sharks and, you know, the cursing starts. And there were two Mako sharks just ripping it to shreds. Wow. I mean, oh. it, was, it was an exercise in how dangerous a Mako shark can be when, when they're hungry. Because these two things were like wolves just tearing at that <laughs> palm fret. It was... Wild. That's tough too. That was that your first experience with one, with with a palm fret. Yeah, that was my first third of a palm fret. Wow. <laughs> I'm going back for more. <laughs> they're really really cool fish. Yeah, um, yeah it's all they purple. Look like yeah. They they look like they're dressed in armor. Yeah, it's all know? purple and armory and shiny. Is yeah, the third look, of it that we got was really cool. Yeah, it looks like an armored. Um, it looks like an armored permit. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, very cool fish. Do so, we do we my, have the um. Opa? Opa? No, yeah. No. Do we have Opa up here? Oh, yeah. let's, talk, let's talk Opa. So, okay, so yeah. Austin Ensor out of uh, Ocean City caught two about three Octobers ago on back-to-back trips. And we're, we're all scratching our head about that. But then my friend Matt Stedman, who uh, runs a boat called Zeta Mac out of the vineyard, was out the same day I was in October. We Last were, year, right? Uh, two years ago, I think. Was it? Yeah, two, year, two years ago. I went west, he went east. He went from Hydro to No Name, set up, set up there. And as he describes it, he's sitting there and um, looking down as he thinks the sword comes up. And all of a sudden, he sees this big round red thing. <laughs> and he starts cursing, get a gaff at it, get a gaff at it. I don't care what it is, just get a freaking gaff at it. <laughs> and lo and behold, he had a 100-pound OPA. And it's, I mean, the, the guy that picked it up was a big guy. And that was a big red round fish. Oh. Pretty cool. So, you know, I'm, I'm on the OPA dream right now. How about Escalar? I was in, when I was in Venice for a media trip a couple of years ago, we were just doing inshore stuff, but a boat came in who'd been daytime fishing for swordfish with a big uh, Escalar, which looks like a, looks like a photo negative of a tuna. Like it's yeah. just. <laughs> I've caught those in Florida. I caught those with the David brothers yeah. in Florida. Um, we, we, had, we had a swordfish trip that I think we caught three Escalar on and you know, they're basically a giant mackerel, as I think it would be described as. It's all teethy, and yeah, like you say, it's all brown, dark. It's 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 an eerie looking thing, mm-hmm. and that's um, white tuna, but yeah. it's got a dirty kick to it. Which oh yeah. Is, I'm not going to say this correctly, but its blood is loaded with some sort of ester, E S T E R which is something that the human body can't digest. So if you eat more than a couple pieces, you're going to spend a lot of time in the bathroom. Yeah. And it's it, not a pleasant experience oh yeah. from what I've been told. That, it, it hits I, the express on the way out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it hits the slip and slide. Um, oh. it's, <laughs> that's one of the uh, most common fish swaps in that whole mislabeling of fish. Yeah, that, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I've heard. Um, I want to go back to Opa, though, because I had Opa in Hawaii on my honeymoon, and it is absolutely delicious. But the, the coolest thing about them is I've heard that when you fillet an Opa, there's like almost six different types yeah, of yeah, meat yeah. to them. I want to have that experience. Yeah. And, you know, and I've, heard that, I've heard that, too. And you don't just take a knife to it. You've, you've got to go figure out how to cut it because it's, you know, you, there, there's... Exactly that, and I wouldn't even know what to do. It looks like that's I, a that's a Chuck Martinson job. I've watched it. <laughs> I've watched it on YouTube a bunch, just just with the off chance that I ever experienced one, and I could be like, I got an idea how to fillet this thing. It looks like an origami, like yeah, like yeah. expert carve out job where all the dotted lines like cut here, fold this over. It's kind of crazy, but th- the most interesting thing is people that you know catch them say that. You could you would feel like you're eating six different types of fish hmm. because the cuts are like like one cuts like bacon. I've seen that video. One cuts yeah, like, like, like this is beef. bacon. One yeah. cuts like pulled pork or whatever. Like it, it's like all over the map. I guess it yeah, seems really cool. I just want to see one. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. you know, there's a couple of things I really want to see. That's one of them. Yeah. the the orca dream is you know is I'm still dreaming of that orca experience. You know? One of these days. Have you seen a uh, whale shark out there? Uh, I've seen more, yeah, half a dozen whale sharks. Wow. Would you be really mad at me if I dove in the water if we, we got close uh, to a whale shark? I'd, I'd, jump all, I'd, swim, I'd, with I'd swim with a whale shark. Well, uh, let's put it this way. The first one we saw, people were about to go in the water when we saw the tiger shark about 50, <laughs> 50 yards away. So, <laughs> so yeah. everyone wants me today. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I can't outswim a tiger shark. Yeah, so... Uh, 
I would love to jump in the water with a whale shark, but I'm not sure that. Let's <laughs> let's let's make a pact. If we if we're ever on a boat together and we see a whale shark, we'll jump in together. We go, go by the buddy system. Whoever, yeah, whoever swims whoever swims slower. Loses. Well, that's only because yeah. I, I yeah. think I might be able to outswim you. I okay. might. It might be close. No, I'm just I'm just joking. I've seen you in a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> only kiddie pools, Jimmy. But uh, no, the canyons are just a special place. But if you if you do see a whale shark, like seeing the tiger shark with it, it's the the life attracts life out and there. And that, that's what it is. So, so okay, so I we we were having a crappy trip in Veach uh, two weeks ago. So I started leapfrogging over to Hydro, and um, we were just randomly picking little notches and exploring. And I went to a notch and set up, and unfortunately, I missed the drift, and we were in eleven hundred feet put a bait down at the bottom and Steve got, he said, I'm getting crushed. This fish is screaming. This is a big fish. So we fought it for an hour and a half and up comes a 10 foot hammerhead. Wow. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Cool, of, but still to, yeah, you know. cool, but the last thing you want to see, I'm sure. But you know, the, you know, let's just talk sharks for a second. So then we go in the troll at six o'clock, you know, we blew our deep drop frustrated. So I, I, I move, move on to the troll and trolling the middle of hydro, middle of nowhere, not a whole lot going on. And all of a sudden I hear in back, there's a thresher in the spread, thresher in the spread. It's 77 degree clear blue water. And I look back and lo and behold, there's that thresher tail coming over and whacking stuff. So Ryan Pruel was with me and he had just bought a brand new Carlson, $200 Carlson splash bar. And he's like, I don't want to get to get my bar so he starts cranking in that Carlson bar at warp speed I see a back come up in the bar so I say the thresh is in the bar ding ding three rods go that by and we had a big eye blitz going on it's awesome. like go explain that thresher in clear blue 77 degree water and the big eye swimming with him could that be one of the different threshers could that have been like a big eye thresher big I don't know but it, it, these are the experiences that keep me coming back yeah we, we lost one, we got one, the big eye was, and, and oh, by the way, that big eye, when Chuck got into a stalemate with it up and down, you know, it was in the situation that I hate to be in, where you're, you know, an hour into a fight, it was one of those big nomad plugs, That's which gives worst. a fish a lot of leverage, and I'm like, I know how this is going to end, all of a sudden the fish screams off, and Chuck's like, beat, oh, no, 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 I can't take this anymore, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he starts cranking, I'm saying, you're getting it, you're getting it, keep it coming, keep it coming, and it rolled up in the surface without a tail, Yeah. something had come Took and his motor eaten, off. you know, eaten it from the tail, <laughs> you so, got the assist, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were very happy, to, thank you, know, you. <laughs> I'd take that 150 pounds, just fine, a we lot, didn't need the other 25, yeah, a lot of guys are like that with big blue marlin, where it's like, I don't want to waste my time with this, because, you know, there's fish I want to catch and, and bring home. Yeah. And, you know, we had a two, a two and a half hour experience the first trip of the year. Uh, screaming runoff at dawn. Uh, tip of East Atlantis, I think. You know, at a temperature break, 67 to 70. Classic giant bluefin, you know, situation. Yeah. Fought it for two and a half hours. Oh, it's brown. No. It's, a, it's, a, it's a manta. Ooh. Oh, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's been the year of the mantis so far. I didn't even think... I thought those things were, were predominantly filter feeders. I am 100% convinced they, they will just hoover anything. In, yeah. You know, the, the, those horns in the front of them. There's a giant mouth under there. I think, you know, whatever they say... <laughs> yeah. yeah, they just vacuum it up. Oh, it's great. Two and, and a half hours on that? Two and a half hours. And, oh. you know, until the end, we <laughs> thought it was a giant bluefin, which we were going to have to release anyway, but... <laughs> Still cooler. You know, I mean, it's it's just not knowing what's going to come up is is probably that's the, the most it, exciting it. part of being no, out there. No two trips are the and same. Then, and out then there. you no. know, there's the, the there's the night thing, which um, I don't know if it was Matt Russell or Andy Dabrowski calls it dip net bingo, which yeah. is you're sitting out there at night in a you know a calm night, and who knows what's going to come into the lights? You know, the coolest oh, little yeah. stuff. Tiny yeah. sailfish. Yeah, tiny yeah, yeah, sail, sailfish. Flying um, fish larvae puffer, are always wild. A puffer fish. Wow. We, we dipped up a puffer fish. It's um, so cool. It's just, it's so cool to see all that stuff. We got squid, on the, the squid came in, and they, I've seen this a couple of times. There's a different type of squid. I don't know what kind it is that, that's in the canyons. They're about nine inches long. They're a really thick, solid, heavy tube, 
and they're black and they're black and purple or black and blue. They look like those black bars that we've all dragged around and say, there's no way a squid looks like this. Well, you know what? That type of squid looks like a black and purple foil bar. That's the type of thing where you think it might be generational knowledge, where we've been trolling, trolling black and purple spreader bars for so long, we forget why we even do it. Yeah. But when they first started doing it, something like that was the reason. Yeah. And you know? I've never seen a squid like that inshore. I've only seen That's it in the crazy canyons. Looking. But you know, they, they were just so vividly black and purple and it, it foil. I mean, that's all I could say. It looked like foil. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, those black bars with the red line and the oil on the top yeah, of them, yeah, like, the, yeah. like the abalone, different colors. That's so cool. So, you know, that's the stuff that keeps me coming back. It's yeah. like, what are you going to see that you've never seen before? And Mitch Buck was out with me a couple of years ago, and uh, he caught a lancet fish jigging. You know, he, he jigged up this, like, two-foot prehistoric-looking thing that was all teeth and a big... You know, comb. They look like a sa- like a sailfish if it came from the Stone Age, right? Yeah, Where there's sailfish, no yeah, bill, yeah, exactly. but it's got the crazy teeth, but still has sort of a sail-like fin. Am, am I thinking yeah, of the right yeah, fish? Exa- yeah. yeah, exactly. It, and it goes down the it goes quite a ways down the spine, but it's all teeth. It was just all mouth. <laughs> and the, and it ate a jig. That's pretty it, cool. It, Not it, many it, people it, caught it, them on jigs. Yeah, like that, that, so. I, one of the guys that fished with me was an ex uh, dragger, and he showed me a picture of an oarfish that it came out of a dragger pile because he they dra- he was on an offshore dragger dragging at 800 feet for squid and you know he showed pictures of sword they had dragged up but he had a picture of an oarfish wild man and that's part of the deep dropping thing is who it knows it's like a way to explore you yeah. like you never know what you're going to hook next when you're dropping a bait down that deep. yeah who knows so we, we did tile fishing a couple trips ago on the way back i we was going to ask you that we, we found the good spot and we're hammering tile fish up comes a couple uh mud hake oh yeah a flounder and then... Uh, what kind of flounder? Yes. <laughs> uh, it wasn't very big. It was I think flat. it might have been windowpane. Um, okay. Windowpane, maybe, sand dab. I don't know. Yeah. And then... One, uh, of, the, one of the oddball flounder. Then up comes a, a black-bellied rosefish, mm-hmm. which is like this little snapper thing. It's like, okay. That's yep. pretty cool. And Steve, who's a Florida guy, was looking at the fish finder and saying... Those are barrel fish. Yeah. You know, I've seen that before. And we, wow. you know, we tried to target them. They were suspended 70 feet above the bottom in 600 feet. Didn't hook up. But, you know, I, you know I'd love to go just bottom fish. Jimmy's first tile fish trip, all he caught was barrel fish. And it was because of a very specific set of circumstances. So I went tile, My first tile fish trip was on the Viking fleet. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, I was like, how deep are we going to be fishing? They said, oh, probably about 800, 900 feet. I'm like. My reel holds 300 yards of line. So <laughs> I, I went there and we fished some shallower stuff and I did okay. And then we went over the deep water and I would hit bottom and I would just scope out. But yeah. I did very well with barrel fish. You know? So <laughs> I caught a few of them. They're, they're really interesting fish. Very dense. You know, very dense. I've seen the juveniles. We get them in shore and they call them barrel fish because when they're small, they, they hang around floating yeah, yeah. debris. The only so, one I've ever seen was like that, yeah. And then once they hit a certain size, they go down to the depths. But they're, they're a weird fish. They're pretty good eating. Yeah, yeah I, I'm told they're good eating. But, you know, he was 100% convinced that we were seeing barrel fish suspended 75 feet up. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What is the weirdest thing you've ever seen floating out there? What is the weirdest thing I've ever seen floating out there? Um, uh, the, well, the scariest thing was seeing a survival suit. And Ooh. Not knowing what to do and still realizing that, you know, you, fortunately it was empty. But I was truly afraid that, you know, I'd find a skeleton in that. Yeah. Ugh. So, you know, was that the weirdest thing I've seen floating out there? Definitely I've, the scariest. I've caught mahi off a, t- uh, a monster mahi off of a floating Panasonic TV back in, <laughs> back in the old tube TV days. Um, it was a color version. You know, the scary stuff you see out there, the docks that float out to sea or the pilots oh. that float out to sea. Um, floating landmines. Yeah, just... And- start thinking about that and um, you've written that's that's part of the reason too that you you go a little bit slower sometimes on the way out just yeah. where it's not going to be a catastrophic collision at night if it does happen yeah, i'm not running you know i won't say i'm not i will run in the sound at speed in the dark but once i get past the hooter i'm pulling back in the dark it's just not worth it you know yeah i, I do not want to be out there sinking yeah at no. 10 p.m no. knowing no one is gonna you I'm know no one is gonna be there till dawn you know yeah no. I don't want to be out there sinking, period. Nightmare but, fuel. You know, you know, I want my, you know, I, I want to have, yeah, I, I want to be able to see if I'm going to run at speed. Yeah. If I clunk at eight knots, you know, it's going to stink, but I'm not going to sink. 
And this year, for the, the first fluking, no, the second fluking trip, the one you didn't go on that was pretty good, I was coming home at 20 knots and, uh, you know, behind Nantucket, and I saw this, like, weed line, a crap line, you know, how stuff feeds up there. And I'm always super vigilant when I go through that because you never know what's in it. You know, I've done this enough to know that's where the ropes and the, the crap collects. So, you know, I looked. I didn't see anything. Went over, and I blah, 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 pulled back, and, you know, we had, um, it looks like a, probably a rope off of a dragger in the, you know, in the props and, you know, 62 degree water. was it? you know, Oh, that's not fun. <laughs> Who goes over the side? Not you. Uh, fortunately I had a guy, <laughs> 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 I had a guy who had never, I didn't know, didn't, had never fished with Oh man on the rough. totem pole. Uh, no, he, I, I'm like, Oh crap. I got to go in. My wife was with me. She's looking at me like, Oh, you're not going out. Yeah. I got to go in. I'm getting up my wetsuit. I'm getting up my fins and flippers. And this guy, Lenny puts up his hand and say, oh, I'll go in. I'll go in. I'm like, you sure you want to do this? It's 62 two degree water. And then the best thing is he says to me, Oh, I train for this. I surf in the cold water. So I train in 55 degree tubs of water so that I'm able to surf. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, <laughs> sounds like you're <laughs> my guy. You're up. <laughs> That's so, awesome. You know, and I can hold my breath two minutes. It's like, well, you know what? I can hold my breath 30 seconds. This is easy. <laughs> How about it? Oh. You want the wetsuit? No, no, no. I don't need the wetsuit. <laughs> Go for it, Lenny. It's oh. too funny. Yeah, the last two canyon trips, one going out, one coming back, uh, the boat I was on hit a shark. Yeah. And I'm like, two in a row. I can't believe it. When was, was that Willie? Was, no, one was a blue shark on uh, Matt Ferroni's boat. And then um, I was um, on a big custom 50-foot um, Enrique's yeah. um, that Cam Crocker was running Fast boat, for yeah. Sandy. And, um, and we hit, I, I, think it, I think it was a basking shark, honestly. It was too big to be yeah. anything other than a basking shark or a white shark. But the blue shark, Matt thought he spun a prop. And I'm like, that didn't feel right. And uh, my buddy Danny was in the back looking out. And he goes, you hit a shark guy. <laughs> and we all look back and it's doing the, the dumb yeah. spin on the surface. <laughs> felt bad for it. But like, I'm like, really? You hit sharks twice in a row? But luckily on the, on the big boat, um, it's you got that vibration. Like I think our trip's over before it started. And he backed it down and everything was like, well, it was fine. And you could see the fin kind of limping away. I was like, oh, man. Yeah, everything was probably fine for that trip, but I'll bet you he had prop damage when yeah you know, when he, when he come home back. and figure it out. But it was it was uh, we, it didn't end the trip, which which yeah, that's the most important thing. And, you know, you actually <laughs> taught, you you actually bring up something really important about canyon fishing yeah. is don't end the trip before it starts by doing doing stupid things. Exactly. Take care of your boat, manage the sea conditions, manage your crew. I've turned back in twenty years. I've turned back two times because of seasickness, oh. and you know it's not something I like to do, but you know, if someone's sick at the beginning of the trip and you're talking about 36 hours and you know, yeah, you don't want to see a guy get seized up and you know, things can happen with seasick. It can, it can go off the deep end real fast. Dehydration yeah. and yoga. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, you gotta manage, you know, your boat to get there. If you know, you know, it sounds terrible, but if you break the boat, break it on the way home. Don't break it. You know, don't break it on the way out. You know, mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> well, my PSA is um, let's do away with all balloons, all oh, helium yeah. balloons. I'm so sick of being offshore and seeing so many balloons out there. It's sickening. And I, I honestly don't think, at, like normal people that don't fish and spend time offshore, I, I don't think they have any clue how bad it is. Well, once the thing terrible. floats away, it's out of sight. Unless you're going out on the water and you're seeing that. It is a... Your average person buying this for, for a happy birthday balloon yeah. doesn't see it, but it is... Uh, you know, it's just getting the message out there. Oh, look, over there, there's, there's debris. Oh, no, yeah. it's just a bunch of balloons. Yeah, yeah and you don't yeah. see them one at a time. You'll see, like, 30 balloons all knotted together because, you know, currents push things together, and it's, it's, it's really sad. So and from I'm a selfish standpoint, they never hold fish. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm convinced a lot of it comes off of cruise ships, too. I think you see those balloon arcs yep. and stuff yeah. that come off of a cruise ship, and... They could care less. Yeah, do away with that stuff, people. Come on. Yeah, it's pretty, you know, the, the amount of debris and crap that you see is, by this time of year, is frustrating. If you just go down towards Lucas, you know, where, where the, uh, the tide comes out of Quicks and Robinson and hits the Vineyard Sound tides, 
you get that eddy that forms just kind of north of Lucas, mm -hmm. and the amount of crap that is in there, the amount of filth, you know, that's just washing up and down the sound. It's disgusting. I almost got thrown off the helm because of that. I was coming back from like Tuna Ridge with my brother, and it had been a real snotty ride home, and I had my tabs buried. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm kind of enjoying the riding because it kind of flattened out once we got that's right, the worst, right that's there. The worst part, yeah. And, you know, I start, you know, giving it, a, I'm, I'm like, wow, we only burned like, you know, not even a half a tank. I'm like starting to hammer down and I just see like brown. I thought I was going to crash into something. So I grabbed the wheel and, and like, you know, went into an evasive maneuver, which you don't want to do with your tabs right, buried right. Oh, and, it, yeah, and they yeah, caught yeah. and it almost threw me right out of the side window of the boat. Oh, uh, I remember that with my Carolina Classic and those tabs in yeah. terms. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's funny that you mentioned that because that's exactly where that was. And it ended up just being a, a weed mat. But it's, it's, you know, it's dangerous. You don't know what's in it. And, you know, I've seen dock pilings and bads, you know, rope, rope piles in there. Um, all those draggers at Vineyard Sounds, you know, stuff comes off of them and ends up in that little eddy. It's, you know, it's, and the amount of crap that you see out there is just so frustrating. Biggest advice you can give somebody that wants to go at it alone, not alone as in by themselves, but for the first time on their own boat, on their own boat, doing it for the first time, crash course, lightning round answer on, you know, how, what's the easiest way to go about it to give yourself a good shot at hooking into a broad bill swordfish? I'd start with a night and I'd focus on getting I'd, I'd go out with half a dozen perfect, I'd go out with a dozen perfect squids pre-rigged. If you can't rig them, buy them. Um, and expect to have them chewed up. I'd bring eels as backup if the squids are destroying it. And I'd focus on getting a spread, one high in the water column, 100 feet, for a surface sword, and get, then getting my second bait just above whatever that thermocline is. Oh, that means that you have to understand your fish finder to find <laughs> the thermocline, and then I'd want to get another one just below it. So I've got a bait high in the water column for a surface, and I've got one above and below the thermocline. And I'd go look at a chart, understand the current, and I'd set up in, let's say, 15, I, I want to be in 15, 1,000 to 2,000 feet, all night long, so I try and set up so that I can make a good drift as long as possible in 1,000 to 2,000 feet. And I'd go in September, I'd pick a nice night, and I'd focus on the night bite. Love it. Uh, what's, what's size weight for 100 and then above and below? All the same? Every, everything, two, oh, everything two pound weights, everything by the, by, sorry, Tim. Buy yourself a good strobe light. You know, it doesn't have to be an LP one, which are 50 odd bucks. Um, you know, buy the $15 ones on Amazon. Um, just zip tie it to the weight. <laughs> Floss loop that on at 40 feet. So now you got your lightweight combination. Get yourself some pool noodles to hold up two pounds. Floss loop, or you know, floss loop is better than rubber band because you're gonna, you want to be checking these every hour. Yeah. You know, don't set it and forget it because they're gonna get chewed up, they're gonna get tangled, something's not gonna be right. You want to check it every hour. If your drift is not right, if you're not going in the right direction, change. You know, move. I move two or three times in a night. You know, uh, you know, I'm. Yeah. I'm really focused in September and October in being in the right place, and I focus on the light change, moonrise, moonset, as much as possible. Interesting. See, that's something I've never heard that about the uh, with the moonrise and set. Yeah. If if I had to say, you know, if uh, I'd say more than fifty percent of our night sword bites are related to a light transition, either, you know, the last of the of the of the sun. The, you know, the rise or fall of the moon yeah. or the first light before dawn. And then the other little piece of advice, you know, kind of a, I won't say a pro tip, but is periodically move each of those baits 10 feet. Don't rip them in, just tease it just a little because I've caught more than one swordfish that I think is hanging around that bait and just that little slow retrieval gets them in. I don't rip baits in when I change them. I, I move them in very slow a little bit stop yeah, stop a little more. wait a while you know when i when i get it in close yeah i'll rip up you know from the from the float up but you know i, I want to give a fish that's curious a chance to eat now when you get beat up if the 
like getting whacked with the bill at night, will you, you know, sometimes if you give them enough time and nothing happens, will you just drop it down and like then reel it back up and mess with it a little bit to see if you can get a reaction Steve bite? Was, Steve was doing that uh, a couple trips ago and I, I don't do that. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to eat, but you know, uh, I watched him moving, you know, he was moving the tip rod up and down, up and down quite a lot. You know, and again, it was slow. It wasn't ripping it up and down. It yeah. was moving up 10 feet, just trying to stimulate that bite. Yeah. But when they're there in October, in September, October, late October, you know, they're there, you know. I mean, and you'll catch them on chunks that time of year. Wow. That's a great roadmap to a first swordfish right there. Like, Love that it. is very easily digestible. That was great. Yeah. Uh, you know, the daytime stuff, if you're going to see, if you want a daytime, you know, I really advise you to find a friend who's done it before and fish. You know, you drive the boat, learn from them, learn how to get it ri everything rigged, learn how to get a bait down successfully. Forget about the buoy till, you know, you've done this a bunch of times. Master the one rod yeah. before yeah, you're adding exactly. the second. Yeah. You know, we caught plenty of fish in 2015, 16, and 17 without a buoy. You know, if you're in the right place and you got the right bait and you got it deployed correctly, if they're there, you're going to get a bite. And you know, go forward from there. Well, Broadbill Swordfish is number one on my hit list. Uh, Jimmy and I often fantasize about how the best way to catch your first Broadbill would be. <laughs> He's like, I want to jig one with the runs. And I'm like, I, I just want to catch one on stand up. But like, um, is that where things are heading? I, you, you brought up the name Lou DeFusco at one point in time. He was involved with the Rhode Island state record right, swordfish. Right. Very accomplished angler. He's fished all over the world. He's trying to figure out a slow pitch jigging setup. I watch that. I think he's nuts, but I give him credit for, you know, <laughs> uh, but you know, people said we were nuts, yeah. you know, you know, so I, I give him credit. I've had two Ronzi's destroyed by swordfish yep. over the years. Rob Daly has caught two jigging. I know others who have caught some jigging. So I cool. think it's, I think, you know, that, that would be the other piece of advice that, you know, in September, October on that chunk bite, you know, jig, you know, jig away with a, you know, with a Ronzi or a, a small flat fall. Yeah. I, I don't want to go down 1500 feet like Lou did, but you know, work in the Did top. he actually do that? Has he, has he started that? I, I saw him putting together, like weeding out. I don't know. Yeah. Down to the gear that he wants to use, what his line's going to be is real and it's a real light setup. But still, you're going to be 1,500 feet deep, which is pretty crazy. So you know, I, the pioneer of pretty much, you know, you and um, and um, John Pilcher, John Pilcher, Pilcher yeah. of day dropping swords up here. And it seems like he's trying to, to be the pioneer of uh, slow pitch jigging, uh, you know, in a deep I, drop I just don't know how you I just don't know how you target that I target them. I mean. It's a situation where anything you hook 1,500 feet down on a jig is going to be something cool. Yeah. Like, swordfish might be the coolest. You know, and he's yeah. talking about using 20-pound test. Well, congratulations. You, you know, you hook something 1,500 feet down. How do you get it up on 20-pound test just from the water resistance? I don't know how he can do that. It's going to be interesting to see it play out. Yeah. So I mean, I, I give him credit. I've caught tilefish to hand cranking, and you know what? At this point in my life... You know, it's, it's a lot easier to, to press the button yeah. than to hand crank up from 600 feet. Oh, such well, good stuff. Captain, I appreciate you making some time oh, for us between fun. trips. Yeah. This, we had a good time. Yeah, so. absolutely. Larry, thank you so much. Yeah, we're doing it this summer. Uh, let's, let's make it happen. <laughs> Middle of the week. You guys are going to have to take two days off. Um, that's easy. Talk to the boss. <laughs> that's easier than the weekend stuff. I'd rather deal with this True. boss than the other boss. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know how that works, yeah. <laughs> Larry, thank you. Thank you All so right, much. All right, that was good. Yeah, thank you. That was great.